I knew uh, in the back of my mind that this was pretty m- I was going to be done with the show eventually. Either they were going to let me go or I was going to go. Hello and welcome to another edition of Here's the Pitch, sponsored by Masses Restaurants in St. Louis. Five locations, stlmasses.com. You know about them because I talk about them all the time. And there's Shuley right there. Oh, my goodness. How exciting. Hello, Bradley. How are you, sir? I'm good. You have a beard. This is, uh, well, let's, let's take a look at everything that's going on. Nirvana shirt, beard, beautiful microphone, good gaming chair. Beard, this is a uh, manifesto look is, is in this year, so I'm, I'm growing the beard out. They said, let's make you part-time. What was that... Um, what was that day like? Did, did you see that coming? Because you said, ah, I moved to Alabama, I, I know this might come. But then the fact that they went ahead and said, screw it, we are going to make you, you know, you, you can still work here. But, uh, and who, who tells you this? Like, I'm always interested in the minutia, who gives this kind of news? Well, it's management. I mean, you're dealing with management and, uh, and you know, nothing happens without, you know, checking with them first. You know, I know there was this, uh, uh, you know, picture painted that uh, I, I, gathered up my family in the middle of the night, rented a truck and snuck away to Alabama. This was a whole process. This was a thing where I had to check and make sure that I could even do this, uh, that, that things could be worked out, you know, with serious, uh, you know, what are the deal with taxes? Like there's all this shit that has to happen before you can just up and leave for Alabama. So management knew management was fine with it. Uh, in fact, you know, they, they were like, listen, you're a huge part, an important part to us, and we will make this work one way or another. And so I felt supported. I felt, cool, these guys understand the situation, and they have my back. And then, uh, you know, when I got out here, you know, it wasn't necessarily their fault, man. I, I think just when I got out here, I just kind of realized mentally that, I wasn't fitting into this anymore. I wasn't, I, 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 other, it's the weirdest thing because you got to understand this was my dream thing. Dream. I don't even want to call it a job, but this was my dream for, since I heard the show was to be a part of it on some level. But I always said to myself, if this ever feels like a job, then it's over. And, and it kind of started feeling that way to me where it wasn't, fun and i know a lot of people out there don't have fun at their job and i get that i did plumbing i did construction or you know i dealt blackjack roulette and i pushed fat people in wheelchairs so when it comes to having jobs that are not fun i got it but uh for me mentally i just felt like i was the clock was ticking i'm missing out on these opportunities uh i'm seeing friends of mine that are growing across the board just from starting simple things like a podcast, you know? And so for me, it it was just, it got to the point where I'm like, I'm not happy. And, and that starts bleeding into my family life and that's unfair to them. They didn't do anything but support me this whole time. So it's time to make a change. And when they offered me that, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't necessarily hurt because, you know, uh, financially, my cost of living now has plummeted. So, you know, to say, hey, we're going to cut your salary in half if I was still living in New York, I'd be like, go fuck yourself. But where I'm living now, that's still doable. Losing the benefits, that I, that I wasn't happy about and didn't really understand. But at the same time, there's a huge part of me. It's 15 years of my life. Walking away was not going to be easy. So... Uh, I agreed to it at first, but then, you know, when the agreement kind of changed a little bit, that's when I was like, okay, you know what? It's just time for me to take control of this and, and do it and do it my way and, and bet on me. And if I fail, I fail, but I don't feel like I will. I'm pretty confident. Hi, darling. Oh, I love when, I love when we see the kids come through. Would you, was this something that other people had to do too, or was it just you? What do you mean? Were you the only one that they said, hey, we're going to make you part-time now because you moved I mean, out? I don't know. I, I, you know I, I don't know. Nobody's come to me from there and said, you know, they tried the same thing with me. I, I, don't, I don't think so. But, again, I don't know. 
What what was the difference when it went from being in the studios in March and then now working from how just tell me the minutia. I'm always curious how it it really came together quickly. Howard's now in his basement, Robin's in her wherever she was, looked like her kitchen. Uh, but the show obviously sounds the same, but they you know, they put out clips and you get to see now Howard's basement and Beth coming in. But what did it what did it how did it change the way the show was done and how did it just talk about that time where everybody kind of just regrouped because you guys all do work in an office and now, you know, yeah. this, this is a big radio show. And I, well, I mean, it's, 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 it's a credit to that, to that team over there, man. They, they're so efficient and there's, there's nothing they can't adapt to. I mean, it's, it's a fucking worldwide pandemic and they find a way to send us equipment and lights and mics and, and, you know, sit there on the weekends and fine tune the audio with people and walk people through installing shit. And, you know, it's a huge, huge thing uh, while you're still trying to keep your family safe. So th that, that team over there, all the people responsible for that, all the tech people behind the scenes, the grunts, they're amazing. As far as for me, uh, as, as an on-air talent, as they uh, like to say, uh, it was a big change. It was a big change because I'd finally gotten into a flow there where I could go to Gary and be like, hey, I got something on high pitch. And he'd go, go in. It wasn't even like, what is it? You know, and there was stages there for years where it was like, you know, it was like TSA, but, you know, but not TSA in the States, TSA in Israel, like where they're hardcore. And they ask you some, you know, are you circumcised? Weird shit to see, you know, how you react. So Gary at first was like, okay, what's the information? Okay, when did you hear that? When did you talk? Now I'm in a point where I'm like, yeah, I got this. He's like, go, boom. So I'm in, uh, and and so for, for, for performance wise, everything changed. And, uh, you know, there was really no way to find that groove. It wasn't as organic as it was. And, uh, and, and I, you know, as a fan, the organic, moments are are the most energetic moments it's uh it's when the entire staff and audience is like holy shit i can't believe this is happening right now yeah i, I agree you know it is hard to do anything on zoom because you have to wait and you can i can't talk when that person's talking so i, I get it yeah but i mean like take for example it was like a month or two ago that dude bill from arizona called in right and and he couldn't have a conversation with Howard. He kept saying, hello, hello, this is Bill from Arizona. And then a couple of us called in, you know, uh, 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 Phil from Arizona, Bill from Barcelona. And it's and it's hilarious. And people are tweeting about it for days. They're talking Facebook, whatever. And that's that's organic, right? That happens on the spot. And the energy for something like that, you can't you can't duplicate that. Let me. So again, I'll I'll keep saying this. I really enjoyed your uh, your podcast and your first one. You really kind of run through a lot of the things I was going to ask you about, so you can hear the whole story of how you started calling in. Um, but I'm just curious, how do you even get through? Because <laughs> I remember, as a fan back in the day, I was like, I'm going to try calling. And, you know, it would be busy. I don't even understand how someone would even get through. So this is what early 2000s. You start calling in from Las Vegas, yeah. and then it turns into. I've got an idea every day. Tell me a little bit about just the, the beginnings of Shuli. You were a comedian. You're working out in uh, Las Vegas, and you're thinking, I want to be part of this show. How do I do it? Yeah, I mean, I had I'd lived in L.A. for 10 years. Uh, you know, well, that's where I discovered Howard in the early 90s when he came on in L.A. And then by the time I got to Vegas, I mean, I had listened to so much of the show. I, I recorded best ofs on cassettes, uh, Whenever I would go on drives with my family, I'd force them to listen to it. So I was a huge, huge fan. And, you know, as far as calling in, like, as dumb as it sounds and, and as wild as it sounds, it was literally like like a movie, like uh, like it was scripted. Like I had this idea when because he announces one night I'm coming to Vegas to do a set of shows from the Hard Rock and we're going to make bets at the blackjack table. And I'm like, shit, I'm going to I'm going to call in. Uh, I had heard this like stock joke from, I worked in this liquor souvenir store in downtown Vegas, like right by where the county jail is and where all the pawn shops are and the Fremont street experience. So I used to meet a lot of interesting people. And this one guy told me this stock joke that I just thought was so funny. It's a street joke. 
So I said, you know what? I'm going to call in. I'm going to, I'm going to proposition how I'm going to say, I'm going to tell you this joke. And if you laugh, I want to make a bet with you guys at the table. And I pick up the phone. I dial the 800 number and, and, sh and sure enough, picks up first time Benji screening the calls. And he's like, what do you want to talk to Howard about? And I tell him and he puts me on hold. And two minutes later, I'm, I'm on the air with Howard doing the joke. He laughed, and next thing you know, he's like, hold on for Gary. And, and from 10, 11 years of listening, I got, my first call, I got booked to make a bet with them at the blackjack table. I remember that. Yeah. Do you remember, do you know what June 6, 2003 is? Does that date ring a bell for you? Uh, I was not on the grassy knoll, if that's what you're asking. Well, what is that? It was your first day sitting in on the show, according to MarksFriggin.com, and... Uh, I'm curious about just sitting in on the show. So you're a caller. Um, you're starting, oh, yeah. to, starting to make your way through, but now you're, you're asked to sit in. What, what is that day like when they call? Just give me a little bit about that. Call, I'm sure it's Gary, but tell me who calls. What, where, where are you? And like, what's that feeling like when they're like, dude, you're going to be sit, not just you know, calling in, not just being in for the news. You're on, I mean, you started the day that morning on the show, according to Mark Sprigg, and yeah. I sort of remember it. Yeah, I, it, you know, it was wild, man. It was, it was, um, you know, to think that they would even give me this opportunity uh, just shows how, you know, how poor the booking was back then really is what it shows. There's no reason I should have. I wasn't ready. I didn't know shit about radio. I wasn't really funny then. You know what I mean? Like I was so new to everything. But again, here's, here's the thing, right? Like, I was calling in with material. I was calling with games, with questions on my own. Nobody asked me to do it. There was no payment for it. I used to have comics in Vegas that would be like, what the fuck are you doing? You're staying up till six in the morning, calling some fucking show. The guy doesn't pay you. The guy, And I'm just like, how do you not get this? To me, it was a no brainer. I'm like, I get, cause you know, Stutter and John would sit here and go, oh, he loves your calls. Or or Benji would say, oh, he really likes your stuff. That's all I need to hear. That's it. I, I'm, I'm doing, that's my job now. And that's literally how I treated it. So when they brought me in, I mean, I'm almost positive because I don't remember a lot about it. I'm almost positive it was terrible. I remember I sat in for the news once at K-Rock. And Gary, to my face, after the segment, I go, uh, I'm just sitting there, my head going, I wonder how that went. And he goes, uh, no, you did a great job. Uh, he goes, why don't you go hang out in the Yucko the Clown room, which was his way of saying the, the bomb room. Uh, and I'm like, I remember at one point Howard saying, and I don't know if it was this appearance, but I remember at one point saying, I like when you call in because I can hang up on you. He's like, can you go call in from the green room? So I probably was just shot out of a cannon, blah, 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 you know, all over the place. I, I know it didn't go well. Um, but uh, well, you said 2006? 2003, June 6, 2003. Right, right, right. That wasn't the uh, hurricane. No, the hurricane would have been yeah, 05. That's hurricane Sandy when they, when they let me sit in. And I got in a big fight with Gary. Um, yeah. I've... So yeah, that that was uh, that was another opportunity that I was like, "Holy shit!" Now I'm gonna run with it. And and that one, I was a little bit wiser, maybe not that much funnier, but uh, I knew that when Gary was getting goofed on, I either had to make the decision to sit there quietly, or jump in and try and be a comic and bust his balls and and get in the mix and. That did not bode well for me for a little while after that. <laughs> I would imagine, yeah. I, so yeah. I didn't, and again, I didn't realize this until listening, that Tim Sabian hired you, a friend of our podcast here, and you, yeah. you started serious. So that's when you become a member of the show, right? So you moved to New York. But but you're really not on the show. That From what I remember, you, would, you weren't on. You were just being a consultant to the news department, right? You didn't really get a full-time kind of jump in on air until you became, quote, the news guy, right? Is that is my memory correct on that? Well, yeah, when he brought me over, there was like an 18, 20-person team, this news team. It was everything from reporters to editors to news directors, producers. I mean, this was 10-10 wins, right, for Howard. This was a huge... Which is like, like ridiculous news. and hilarious at the yeah. same time. It's It's the greatest bit ever, and it's like... And so for me, 
I'm like, what the fuck do I, I'm not a journalist. I don't know how to interview people. I'm not looking to break any news. Like, what do I do? Well, my first thing I had to do was explain to all these people what the show was, who was who on the show, what was what, because these people are real journalists. They didn't spend, you know, their fucking years waiting on hold to talk to a guy and recording fights on the show. So, you know, I had the information they needed. I shared that with them. But once I did that, I was like, all right, well, now how, how do I stay here? Right. How do I become a part of this? And so that's when I just I went with what I liked as a fan, which was the whack pack and the back office stuff. And I also went with what I knew, which was being a comic, doing crowd work, fucking with people. So I tried to incorporate those two into my stories, which at the end of the day, I was the only one doing those things. And it kind of solidified a spot for me in that team. It went from 20 people to four. And I was one of the, these reporters, you know, and, and it was amazing. And I loved it. So I was never my hour. I never started when the show started. That wasn't my hours back then. Um, I was there like, I, I came in like 8.39, somewhere around there. I didn't have, you know, they used to send us in to read headlines. I didn't have a regular spot in that rotation. If somebody was out or couldn't do it, then I would go in and do headlines for them and come in earlier. But no, I wasn't a part of things. Um, I just did my news stories. That was my, I treated the news. That was my main gig. And that's what I did. When that starts kind of dissolving, do you get a little worried that, all right, he's kind of lost interest and oh, they've lost money, whatever it is. Um, is it sort of at that point, like, oh shit, do I start looking now? Or did you feel still sort of comfortable there? Because you were one of the four, like what was it Lieberman and, I don't can't remember the other who we have still. But. Well, there was I mean there was Langford, there was Lisa G, there was. Uh, well, by the time uh, there's Lieberman. four, yeah. By the time there's four, there's yeah. only you, Lieberman, and I can't really even think of the other. Ralph Howard. That's right. Yeah. Um, and I believe was well, me, Lisa, Ralph Howard, and Lieberman. Yeah, and that, and then yeah, Mike Hambrick came in after Ralph left, and I mean I've worked with some amazing people. They're really talented talented people and and learned a lot from them you know ralph howard langford lieberman those three alone just really taught me how to interview and how to listen to people and and pick up what you need to pick up out of it uh but um you know and lisa was fantastic too lisa you know just being around those people all the all the different life lessons that they learned throughout life and and sharing with me that's big, man. You you can't get that anywhere else. Um, experience. People who've had experience and shit and share it with you. Uh, but when it started dissolving, I don't know that I was necessarily worried because, you know, I went through a few phases there where, you know, they were like, uh, I was like, let's scale back on the whack pack. And I'm sitting here going, well, that's my thing. Like, I can't scale back on them. This is, I don't have any other beat. <laughs> right? So... So I never did. I just tried to up the game and be like, well, now I really got to come with some good shit. And, and then he, he can't back off of him. Like he'll, he'll play if it's good, he'll play it. And that's always what happened. Um, and so I felt like at the end of the day, when I, when I just focused on the whack pack, that was essential to me surviving when the news disbanded, that was it. Everybody else left and was gone. But the, the one thing they didn't have with somebody as a conduit to the whack pack and i'd been doing that for years so it was a natural fit right whack pack whisperer <laughs> you're the, yeah you're the man what what so the, the the we talked about the news changing but then there, there's that youtube clip of the summit meeting where howard says i want a list guest what what was your feelings at those points of seeing these changes come through there and and the way that there was different people coming in and and I know the word evolving is always used, but how did it hit you and how did it hit the people around you? Did you feel like, oh, shit, this is, this feels weird and different? Hey, look, it felt different, but but uh, when it's all said and done, I'm a soldier, right? You tell me to step off of this chopper and we're going in. We're fucking going in, man. This is, this is you know, he took a chance on me. He had my back and brought me in with zero, absolutely zero radio experience to his program. The, the biggest and the best ever. 
So what the fuck, man? You want a list guest? I'll go out of my way and try and make this happen, man. Let's make it happen because if he's happy, then we're happy. If if he wants to stay working, then we're staying working. And that was my mentality back then. Uh, and I don't think it was wrong. I think, you know, the people that didn't dig it, they didn't stick around much after that. And that's fine. Uh, eventually, it got to a point where I didn't want to stick around. So I get it. But at that point, I wasn't like, <gasps> like everybody's like, oh, my God, this summit meeting, you know. And I love the people that think that that I had something to do with the recording of it. Like, if you watch it, I'm literally two rows up. You can see my bald yarmulke pa pattern fucking head sitting there. So, you know, but it, it, listen, man, it's his call. It's his fucking game at the end of the day. So if, if you're going to bitch about it, you're not really a team player anyways. You've been really candid uh, since you've left the show about just sort of talking about your experiences there, but we don't hear a lot from a lot of people when they leave. They don't, and I've noticed this yeah. just by doing this podcast. People have enjoyed hearing from a lot of people, Doug Goodstein, Tim Sabian, but there's a full list of people that are just not wanting to talk about their experiences. What is that? What do you think that is? I know, I mean, like people like Scott can't. Scott the engineer has an NDA, and there's probably a few others that we don't know, and maybe that's why. But why, why do you think some folks are just not wanting to talk about uh, any of the experiences they had there once they leave? I don't know. I don't know. I, th I think, I think uh, for me personally, you know, I decided that I'm a comic, right? I don't like when people tell me what I can and can't say, you know? I don't, you know, I, I had, I had uh, a comic once who was booking a show in Vegas, didn't want to put me up because I, I was wearing jeans. And, and I'm like, shit like that bothers me, right? So when it got to the point for me where they were like, hey, you can do your, your side shit, you know, you lose half your salary, you lose your benefits, but you can do your side shit. But, you know, the last 15 years, serious, the show, Howard, you can't talk about any of that. And so for me, I was like, well, okay, look, I'm not looking to shit on the guy. I have nothing bad to say about him. But 15 years of my life is 15 years of my life. And I and I should be able to share a story about running into Norm McDonald in the hallway and him asking me to go to lunch. And then we I work Caroline's with him. Or, you know, whatever the fuck it may be. Saying hi to Spade, say, you know, anything. My Gene Simmons story that I told in the first episode, right? That happened on the sidewalk right outside Sirius. Am I violating this agreement by telling these stories? Because that was my issue. And that was my thing where I'm like, look, can I just get something in writing? Can I just get something in writing that says, here's what you don't want me to talk about? And I'll sign it. And, and management was like, well, you know, this is kind of the way it is. And so I said, you know what? I'm going to, I'm just going to, leave it all on the table. I'm going to walk away. And now you can't tell me anything. And it was a risk and it was a gamble. And it was a lot of money, but peace of mind being able to, to sit here and talk to you or my, or just on my show and answer questions that, that to me is worth a lot more. And the, the payout from it, what I'm seeing from people, the responses, and almost everybody, whether they liked me on the show or hated me, they love the honesty. They love the the fact that I'm sharing, that I'm not shying away from shit, but I'm also not shitting on anybody. It, it can be done. It is possible. And so I, I've, I've always wanted to do things on my terms with that show. I love Richard and Sal, but I'm never going to paint my dick as a KISS member to get airtime. And, and so for me, that was a big thing. Like, I'm going to get on the air my way. And I was going to leave my way. I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to join the bitter crew. I wasn't going to join the haters. You know, are there shit that pissed me off there? Absolutely. I worked at a place for 15 years. Anywhere you work for 15 years, you're going to have bad days. You're going to have people that rub you the wrong way. But do I want to write a book about it? Do I want to do a podcast every week talking shit about this? That kind of negative energy is just, it's just an anchor, buddy. It's, it's, you're never going to progress. You're never going to, I want to grow as an artist. I want to 
grow as a broadcaster. I'm not going to do that talking about, you know, talking about the show every day. So yeah, for me, uh, I, I don't, I don't have bad shit to say about the guy. I I'm, I'm glad that I'm able to talk. I'm glad that that's the thing that people are hanging on to and digging about the show is that I'm able to talk and I'm, and I'm digging the fact that people are saying, Hey, I'm glad you didn't shit on it. I'm glad you didn't do this or that because I am too. No, it's good. And I've, like I said, I've been following you for, for years. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what you do there. I know you've got an interview today with someone I'm interested to listen to. So I, I look forward to that. Yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll let you t- talk about that. Uh, just a couple more minutes here, but uh, I think wh- when people leave the show, I guess the fact that it's never mentioned on the show just lets people's m- imaginations run wild, and so that's what happened with you. Also happened with Brent, who's been a part of this, and I, you know, you just read all these conspiracy theories, but what was it like when Brent left? And, and you guys were pretty tight by the end, right? But what was it like when he left? Because it was one of those, he was there, he was doing stories, he was on the air a lot, and then he was gone. What was it like for you? And just tell me a little bit about uh, your relationship with him, because he's a he's a fun guy, and he was he was uh, he was funny here. Yeah, I like Brent. Brent's a good dude. He's he's a hustler. Um, you know, when he left, uh, yeah, it was weird. I I now didn't have an office mate to uh, cut his fingernails next to me while sitting at his fucking desk like an animal. Uh, where I'd have to dodge ricocheting nail clippings off a goddamn wall. I miss that. Uh, I missed him with headphones on, just humming like a mental patient, but there was no music. He was just humming to him. It's almost like a full orgasm all day long. It was tough. It was tough to to not have that anymore. You know, seeing his hotness around the office was nice too. I mean... Seven is being modest. That dude's more like a 17. And uh, his honesty, I miss the most. You know, the guy never lied to me about anything. And uh, I always respected his honesty. Uh, Brent's a good dude, man. He 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 can take it <laughs> to a point. And I always love pushing him past that point. And then, and then he would calm down later because when it's all said and done, he loves radio. And so one person would come to him in the office because we'd go back. You got to understand, we fucking go at it on the air and then we shared an office. So we go back to this office and his back's to me and my back's to him. It's quiet. And one person would just come in and go, great shit, guys. And then that would be like, for him, it'd be like, oh, thanks, man. Thanks. And then he turn and then he turn around and he'd be like, that was pretty good, huh? And I'm like, yeah, dude, that was good. You know? Until the next time I pissed him off and he would look at me like he wanted to wear my skin. Was it weird when he left, though? Or, I mean, was that surprising to you? I don't know if you guys talked about it, but was it just like, an odd thing? Because, again, people were like, where'd he go? Why is he gone? And he pretty much mentioned, he was like, I needed to get to Florida. I was scared of COVID. I wanted to get the hell out. Kind of like your story-ish. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, yeah, they were in an apartment. You know, he had a fucking German shepherd in an apartment with him. Like, that's... That's like having another apartment in your apartment with you um, in New York. Or they were in Jersey City. Uh, yeah, I get it, dude. Like, I don't fault the guy. I don't fault anyone, whether you're at a show, at Home Depot, at fucking Circle K. If you get to the point one day where you're like, I got to get out of here. Go. D- listen to your gut. Follow your instinct, man. I- I'm very happy for him. I was happy for him. Because I know he was stressed. I know he was he was stressed about, you know, COVID and where they were at and and work and that kind of stress, man. That's how you get sick. That's how you get COVID. That's that's when your immune system gets shut down, is when you are stressing and worrying about everything. So I was very happy to hear him go and that he was he was happy and and relieved and he started doing his own thing. The guy's fucking grinding. He's getting there. Him and Kalen, they're hustling, they're working. And respect to them, man. A couple more minutes. I always ask my Howard Stern guests about Artie Lang. Tell me about uh, those days when, when it was getting weird, and did you get a chance to, to talk to him in those days, try to help him? And I know you guys, I don't even know if you went on a couple tours with him, maybe. And what's he up to now? I don't, do you get a chance to talk to Artie? I know it's, <laughs> no one does, but I always have to ask because I would like to know how he's doing. And uh, just give me some of the, those times back in the, in the late uh, 2008s, 2009s, things are breaking down. And, what was it like for you just to watch that happen? And how's he doing? If you know. I mean, well, but 
first of all, I don't I don't know how he's doing. I'm about nine cell phone numbers behind on him, uh, so I haven't talked to him in quite some time. I, I shoot him a DM here and there, uh, but I haven't heard back. Um, I hope he's good. I hope he's with his with his mom and his sister. Uh, the fact that he's not on social media, I think, is a very good sign. Uh, the fact that he's not anywhere really, I think, is a good sign. I think he's taking care of himself, what he needs to take care of, number one. As far as w w the arty years, the end, uh, I hated it. I hated every second of it because there was there was nobody more genuine. And, I mean, he looked out for me when I got out there. He, I got out there in 05, 06, November of 06, he invited me to his mom's for Thanksgiving, right? He didn't need to do that. He invited me to his mom's for Thanksgiving. And on the drive out there, he was just schooling me on radio and being a comic and how, like, hey, you're doing this Killers of Comedy tour, and, you know, you're not going to make as much as you should because you're going to be doing a lot of the material with Levy. But there's guys who are going to be making more than you because they're on the air. And so you got to be okay with that, and you got to understand that. you got to make a decision how you're going to get on the air and how you're going to be perceived. And that was a big thing for me, you know, as far as like, he, he wasn't necessarily knocking anybody, but he was just like preparing me for the mind fuck of like, you know, Richard and Sal are going to do, you know, well, not Sal was actually, Sal would do about 15 minutes and Sal, I always say can do stand up anywhere. Richard, Richard was doing stand up because he could, because there was, there was a market for it, but Richard would go up there and do seven, eight minutes at best. And Richard made, I mean, for somebody making eight, doing eight minutes, Richard made great money. And there were times on the road where I made less than him, but I was doing 30, 35 minutes and Levy was closing out the show doing the same. We were bookending it. I was hosting it. So that's what he was preparing me for. And that's, and then he let me into his mom's home and we sat there and had dinner with his family. And, and on the way back, uh, we went and saw the James Bond, uh, movie and, uh, got stoned, you know, smoked a, smoked a bowl in his car and fucking went. And I'm sitting here and I'm going, I'm, I'm still a super fan. And I'm like, I'm fucking, I'm in Artie's Mercedes smoking a bowl with him going to see, you know, James Bond. Um, those were my favorite. Those are my favorite memories. Uh, him, no, such a great storyteller, such a great ball buster, and just a really sweet guy. And, and working with him on the road was both uh, – great and depressing you know to see him not be able to enjoy it was a bummer as for me as a comic you know this is a, this is a, a a level i'm shooting for right i want to be playing theaters like this guy i want to be but you know i would sit there and go well fuck is is this what comes with it right you just sit lock yourself in the green room with headphones on and you don't talk to anybody i got in to stand up to work with my friends not not to be in a different green room, but it also it wasn't already, right? And and so you had your suspicions, you had your hunches, but you know, nobody ever saw him do it. Um, but yeah, I, I love the guy. And if there's anybody I will root for ten out of ten times, no matter what, it's that dude. Uh, I wish him all the best and I hope we hear from him soon. I would I would kill to have him on my podcast. Love to talk to him. You and me both. Let's do it together. We'll do a tag team interview what oh if he goes on your shit before mine i'm fucking blowing my brains out i'll tell you that right now i'm gonna work on it. if he if i see him with hit with with and you and that fucking hair i'm gonna jump out a goddamn window well now i'm going to work very hard and so yeah i've i had a number for him as well a long time ago but yeah i don't think it's the same number it was 10 years ago what is uh 2021 going to be for you? So you're going to do you're going to do podcast. I, I assume you're going to try if, if things open up stand up comedy again. Tell me what tell me everything you're doing and how to, how do we listen and find you and and tell me what you what you got planned for for this uh the new the Shuli tour of I don't know what what are we calling? Are we calling it anything? Shuli's uh, I think break. we're I think we're calling it the Freebird tour. I think I'm coming out to Skinner every night. Uh, because really the only clubs open are, are in the South. <laughs> it's funny, the one place I moved to, it's where comedy's still legal indoors. Uh, we, I, so I have, uh, well, first the podcast. So the Shuli Show 
uh, originally is available on Patreon. It's a subscription-based show uh, through Patreon, but you get a video of the show as well as audio, and you get bonus content. Now, my bonus content that I, I do at least once a day is I drop a video uh, out of my phone, which is, it's me cleaning my cloud. I have uh, about 15 years worth of whack pack stuff that nobody's ever seen. It's never aired. It's all stuff from comedy shows that I've done or different appearances that I've done with them that um, that's never been seen anywhere. So that's the bonus content I drop at least once a day. Uh, there's really great videos on there. And then uh, I just started this Saturday doing like a little bonus shit, you know, just kind of talking to patrons and fucking around. You get the show early, you get the show ad free, then uh, and it's every Tuesday night. And then that Friday, the show comes out on all platforms. Um, and, and so that's the podcast. Then you have uh, Twitch, uh, Shalom Shuli TV on Twitch. If you are into seeing mediocre gaming from a mid-40-year-old uh, Jew, then check that out. You won't be disappointed. I play with a bunch of comics. It's a lot of fun. And, um, and then the social media, uh, oh, Cameo, I, I jumped on that fucking bandwagon and it's great and uh i got a lot of stuff planned for 2021 you know i'm recording later today uh something really special that i'm looking forward to that anybody who is an og of the serious years i think will get a kick out of this and it's something that i didn't think i would ever be doing um and there's a lot of other surprises you know uh I, I don't want to reveal too much, but there's there's people there's people moving. There's people making moves right now, and they're moving to the Shuli Show, and that's all I'll say. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, it's and and the underdog lady was she the original QAnon? What is her deal? I've always wondered about her because she doesn't hey, she doesn't hey, have Down have syndrome. A little respect for my lady, Brad, for I knocked that toupee off your fucking head. Tell me, uh, uh, what is her? What is her? All the other whack packers I can kind of figure out. Now, yeah. I've watched the Channel 9 show. I mean, I came in in the midnight, early 90s, the Channel 9 show. I saw the underdog lady. I'm shocked yeah. she's still alive. I'm shocked she still does the same. I mean, it's, it's amazingly great that she does not change. I think it's, it's – it may – as I'm talking myself through it, she may be my favorite whack packer because of that, that there's been no change to this character. Tell me, what is, what is her deal? Uh, her deal is called autism, I believe, or Asperger's. I'm not sure which one. She's uh, definitely on the spectrum. She's a lovely woman. Uh, she, you hit it on the head. She, she is who she is, and she will not falter or sway for anyone. And as a lifelong fan of the show and seeing her on Channel 9, all those appearances, I remember when I started working up there very vividly one day thinking to myself, I am going to get this woman back on the show. But at that point, it was about, I guess, doing what did what was done in the past, right? I guess in my mind at that point, I was like, I'm going to get her back on the show so we can goof on her. But then when I started talking to her and spending time with her on the phone and really, you know, there's no five minute conversations with Suzanne. They're all 40 minutes, 35 minutes, and you're hearing two minutes of it, you know? It's not to say that the rest is shit. It's just that's what you're hearing. That's the best of the best. Once I got to know her and she really opened up to me, that's when I was like, you know what? Uh, we shouldn't bring her in and goof on her. And Howard, Howard, to his credit, was like, I'm not looking for her to come in. I like her talking through you and to you. I like that. And and I liked it too. And And, you know, for me as a fan to be able to just have her voice back on the air in any way. And I actually had her call in once uh, when Kimmel was there. So for me, that was like, a, I succeeded. You know, I got her back on the show, even though she, was, she wasn't happy about it. <laughs> but, uh, but I still talk to her regularly. Uh, that's somebody that I, I will not break ties with. And, you know, I'm try I tried to because again, I'm still a fan of the show. I want I want both worlds to exist. Uh, you know, and I tried to kind of set her up with somebody over there to talk to, but she she does not want to talk to anybody else over there. So I think what I'm gonna do 
is do like a podcast with her, a free one. And then that way the show can just use clips of that and they, she can still be on the show. You know, everybody wins, right? That is very sweet of you. <laughs> Who? I mean, she she needs to be heard. I'm sorry. That's just these conversations. They they should be in the fucking Smithsonian. I'm sorry. They, I, they're just amazing. I think I was driving around maybe three months ago, and they were playing something, and it was her. And I, I I had not heard her in forever, and it was like literally like took me back to when I was 18 watching the show. And I'm like, this woman has not changed. I love it. I just she'd do these parades, and it just it's it's like I said, the fact that she has not taken the stardom. She's <laughs> I don't know anything about her. I said said to her, I said, we can answer, you know, uh, questions from from listeners. They can email. And she just goes, I I don't have email. (laughs) I'm I'm not asking you to get email. Relax. So. Well, I've I've enjoyed our time here. I guess my last question would be, who who do you not miss from the show? Jason Kaplan? Who's who's the one person you're like, I'm glad I don't have to work with that guy or girl? You don't have to answer that. I, I don't have anybody that that I'm that. Who? What is that? Uh, you don't have to answer. I said you don't have to answer. But it's Baba Booey. <laughs> no, no, man. Listen, Baba Booey. While we had our battles, was was instrumental in me turning it all around and getting the airtime that I eventually got up there. It, it, you know, us fighting on the air was a big, big changing point for me. So I, I, I refuse. To have were there days that people pissed me off that I was like fuck this fuck this dude or fuck her or whatever yeah absolutely but I don't take that shit with me man I, I I wish the best for everybody I hope everybody succeeds over there I know I'm gonna succeed over here and uh, and yeah I, I miss everybody over there man I wish them all the best well I wish you the best and I would say work with Conrad that man is a genius his shit is great. Um, and, uh, it's good that you, you guys don't have to tell me, man, you, if, Hey, if you believed in them, you'd be in fucking Huntsville too. It's, it's very possible. I'll be living next door to you very soon. <laughs> uh, that guy's a very a bit genius, but thank you, Shuley, for joining me. This has been great. I really enjoyed it. And I hope everybody, I mean, everyone knows how to get a hold of you, but, uh, it looks, it's going to be fun to watch what you do. And I think, uh, I think it'll be fun to, uh, follow the Freebird tour. Uh, and you watch here Thanks, when Artie Lang shows up here before over there. But that's going to do it for Here's the Pitch. We'll see you next time. Thanks for I will watching. shut your shit down, dude. I will have my followers. And I'm number one in South Korea. I don't know if you saw that, but my podcast was number one on the South Korean charts for comedy interviews. And I'm still waiting for data from North Korea. But South Korea, we're crushing it. And so don't make me get my boy band army to shut your shit down because I will. We'll leave it at that. Thank you, Shuli. Have a great day, and we'll see you next time.